Previously on the show, we had the VAC191, a German VTOL and Stall Strike aircraft. However, this plane was not the only aircraft with vertical takeoff and landing capability that Germany developed in the 1960s. In fact, when it comes to complexity and pushing the limit of what was technologically possible and feasible, they certainly won up themselves with today's guest. This is the Dornier Do 31. It's a transport plane. And yes, that doesn't sound very exciting, you might say, but allow me to explain to your viewer. It's a VTOL transport jet plane. The only one in the world. It's Sherman. The aircraft is operated by a crew of two, is 20.8 meters in length, has a wingspan of 18.1 meters and a height of 8.5 meters. It weighs 21,000 kg for maximum vertical takeoff and up to 27,500 kg for maximum conventional takeoff. Developed to meet NATO specification NMBR4, the Dornier Wege GmbH designed its cargo space to hold a standard 3-ton NATO lorry. Now, while the aircraft might not be able to bring in as many supplies as many other transporters, its VTOL capability was considered at a time to make it more flexible. However, only two flying examples were built, so let's have a closer look at this one found here at the Flugwerft in Schleißheim near Munich, Germany, to find out all about this aircraft. So you'll have noticed that the aircraft has quite a few engines, 10 to be exact. It has two Bristol Sydney BE-53 Pegasus engines for vertical lift and cruise under each wing, providing 15,000 pounds of thrust each. And the vectoring extended to 30 degrees 4 from the vertical and 90 degrees aft. An additional eight Rolls-Royce RB162 turbojets were added as lift engines, four per wingtip. These provided about 4,500 pounds of thrust each. Uh, they were similar, although slightly less powerful than the same engines used on the VAC 191. These could be vectored 15 degrees fore and aft, and to prevent the aircraft from going rogue in case of a failure in one of them, each engine was coupled with the respective counterpart on the other wingtip. The total output was around 66,000 pounds of thrust of the aircraft, but this was mostly used only for vertical takeoff and landing. Now, the aircraft itself had a maximum speed of around about 710 kilometers per hour with a max range of 1,800 kilometers. Okay, so we're going to have a walk around on a Dornier Doe 31. First of all, the prominent long nose that you might have already asked yourself, what is this for? This is simply because the aircraft was still a prototype and a lot of flight data was being gathered as far out from the aircraft as possible. If it would have gone into production, it would certainly have been omitted as well. As we move on towards the aircraft, we of course have the front gear of the tricycle landing gear and then we have a look at the greenhouse canopy there. It's quite a nice little futuristic look. The aircraft itself has that sort of sci-fi vibe really. And as we walk around further we have the, of course we have some windows and we also have the red markings there for emergency access hatches. There's actually not a lot on this aircraft to point out since it's very clean design. We've got the Pegasus engines here also used on the Harrier with the variable uh, nozzles on the side, those are of course the uh, black uh, devices there. Uh, we have one of these engines actually in front of us right here. You can see the nozzle once again that would rotate depending on what you needed for vertical takeoff on landing. Up top, the first wingtip on the starboard side here, those, that one would house the four RB162s uh, on each, either side. And as we move around, of course, you have the aileron and the flaps of the aircraft for normal, for normal uh, flight. And then this panel here that you see that is sort of 
It looks like slightly corroded. That is just to protect the engine nacelle here and the gear nacelle from the heat that comes out of the engine as it is using the nozzles. The rear of the aircraft, we of course have the big cargo door here for the aircraft. Now, in itself, it didn't load that much, uh, that much cargo, but we'll check that out in just a second. Before we do that, however, there is an air bleed puffer system all the way on top that we can see there as well. And if we look all the way on top, we of course have a large vertical stabilizer, a rudder and horizontal stabilizer, and also a twin set of uh, elevators. Now, moving inside, welcome into the cargo space of the Dornier TO31. Three ton NATO lorry could fit in here. Supplies, men, whatever you need it. However, as a cargo plane, that capacity isn't that large actually. But as I said initially, the flexibility that people thought they would get with this aircraft because it could take off and land everywhere would compensate for that. In the end, more supplies might just be better. Now, as we move along, we of course, we have one of the emergency hatches. And then of course we have the cockpit, which we are also going to be checking out. Another emergency cutaway that we can use here. Access hatch, of course, if you're moving in supplies, you can take the rear doors, but this is the normal sort of crew access hatch. And as we move out, there we go. That really ends our walk around on the Dornier DO31. So we're inside the cockpit of the Doe 31 and this is the first time I'm actually seeing it because getting pictures from the aircraft is a little bit difficult since it was essentially a prototype only. A lot of what you see here, right here would also have changed if this aircraft would have ever gone into full production or you know, production on uh, beyond this prototype that was constructed, the three prototypes that were constructed. But for now, I'll show you what, what we have here. First of all, we of course have the pilot seat and the co-pilot seat right there. And then there's the station in the back here to the starboard side. We have a lot of circuit breakers and what looks uh, sort of uh, electrical systems for the various different parts of the aircraft. As well as that, on the port side of the aircraft, now to my right, uh, we have electrical power to some of the important systems like TACAN, uh, the autopilot and so on. And we also have the electrical power for the radio and the intercom, the IFF and so on. Sorry, the VHF, the IFF was not yet fitted to this aircraft since it was a prototype. Now, as we move on to the actual flight controls and the gauges. So let's have a closer look at the cockpit layout and instrumentation in the Dornier DO31. Keep in mind this is an experimental plane and, and that there is very little information available out there when it comes to the cockpit. We start us off in the central position with the flight control mode selector, allowing you to switch, for example, between your approach radar or TACAN. Beyond it, the stabilization system together with failure warning lighting. The lever to the right is the flap lever with preset increments of retracted 15, 30, 45 and 60 degrees. Forward of this lever, the nacelle flaps control for the lift engines. The pedestal is a complex one, as you might expect. In the outside positions, the main engine nozzle levers. Currently, they are set to cruise. While fully retracted, they would swing each nozzle by 120 degrees, thus pointing 30 degrees four from the plane's vertical axis. It seems these levers could be operated either independently or coupled, as a NASA report indicates that the common use was to have the co-pilot operate the main nozzles, while the pilot worried about aircraft control. One desired improvement was to have the nozzles and the throttle linked, but this was not realized. Speaking of the throttles, here we have the main throttle levers for the Pegasus engine. To the right, the lift engine throttle for the outer nacelles. A single throttle controls all eight lift engines. In the middle, a small knob for the friction control. And to the bottom left, the rudder trim. In front of the pedestal, the fuel supply system, as well as the fire extinguisher switches. Now we come to the central position of the instrument board. It looks complex, but is straightforward once you wrap your head around it. To the bottom, the fuel gauges for all five fuel tanks. Straight above these, the lift engine RPM meters, numbered and aligned by their respective side. One through four is to port, five through eight to starboard. To the right, the respective engine temperatures numbered in the same way. Temperature warning lights are also set in the middle. 
The main engine gauges can be found to the left on the pilot side. From top to bottom, air inlet temperature, low pressure compressor RPM, turbine temperature, high pressure compressor RPM. The small dials on the bottom are for the oil pressure. I'll add that in the manual, the RPM and temperature gauges were respectively located above and below the main turbine inlet temperature indicators and not mixed like here. To the top, you will find the pitch trim indicator, the pitch trim preselect, and the trim indicator showing from left to right, the rudder, aileron, and elevator trim deflection. To the bottom, the flap deflection indicator. To the right, we find the system failure warning lights. Now we shift over to the pilot station. To the top right, the vertical speed indicator. Then we have the airspeed, the attitude direction indicator, the altimeter, and below the horizontal situation indicator, followed by the turn coordinator, your radar altimeter, and the artificial horizon. You will also find the all-important clock, the radio magnetic indicator, and your main engine nozzle deflection indicator. A triple brake pressure gauge can also be found. To the right, the gear lever is accompanied by the gear position indicator. The flight stick and rudder pedals round off the look. Also notice the see-through window between the rudder pedals for improved visibility during VTOL takeoff and landing. The co-pilot station is similar, albeit a bit simpler, to the pilot's. He has an outside air temperature gauge, but, more importantly, you can also see another pitch attitude indicator here, together with an angle of attack meter. These gauges would also be found on the pilot side in the very same position. Next to them you will also find status indicators for your control surfaces. And between and above the pilots, you will find a lighting control panel, windshield demisting, as well as the intercom, radio and navigational control panel. The Dornier Do 31 is actually a really cool design. It's the only aircraft of its kind that ever flew, a VTOL transport aircraft. It was a result out of a short craze among NATO countries with the possibilities created by VTOL and Stoll aircraft. Development started around 1962 based on a requirement by NATO. The first conventional test flights were in 1967 with vertical takeoff and landing as well as transitioning to and from the vertical being tested by the end of that year. By this point, however, NATO's interest in the project started to disappear. The DOE 31 might be an interesting concept and the fact that it not only flew, but actually flew surprisingly well, was remarkable. As was its short development time, considering that this was cutting edge technology. From a pure technological standpoint, this aircraft is extraordinary. Then again, it couldn't actually load that much cargo, was maintenance intensive, expensive, and required a very specialized team. Transition from the vertical to the horizontal and back also required everything the pilot really and the machine had and was deemed somewhat, shall we say, overly complicated to be realistic in operational conditions. Among West Germany's allies, few actually wanted to invest into this aircraft. Now you're suddenly looking at an aircraft really that was more of a prestige project than a realistic addition to NATO. The concept itself attracted much publicity, really. Uh, Dornier was also able to use that to push ahead the idea of a passenger travel in this uh, aircraft, to convert it to passenger travel. Um, and also it was briefly picked out by NATO in the US for testing. But there is no VTOL passenger plane around just yet, so that never really got any far. Then again, as a symbol for technological progress, discovery and aeronautical engineering, the Dornier Do 31 is as special as it gets. There were three built, E1 through E3. E2 itself was a non-flying test bed, while E1 and E3 are exhibited in different museums in Germany. One being, of course, the Dornier Museum itself, and the other one being here, the Flugwerft Schleisheim near Munich. I want to thank the Deutsche Museum Flugwerft Schleisheim for allowing me to get close with the exhibit so that I could show it off to all of you. 
If you want to visit the museum, check out the link in the description below for all up-to-date visitor information. If you enjoyed this video, please also support the channel via Patreon or channel memberships because that's what allows me to visit these museums and film there. Please also consider sharing the video. And as always, thanks for watching, have a great day and see you in the sky.